Okay, so this is the first of an eight lecture, uh, uh, eight part lecture series on Philo of Alexandria, philosopher, mystic, and defender of his people uh, by Rabbi Lawrence Troster. And today we're going to look at the history of the Jews of Alexandria and the life of Philo. And this is important to set Philo within his historical context, partly because we really don't know a lot about his uh, personal life, his personal biography. Um, and uh, he also, uh, the, the other important reason for doing this is, he comes out of what I consider one of the great um, Jewish civilizations, that of Alexandrian uh, Jude, uh, Jude, uh, Judaism, um, or some people call it Hellenistic Judaism, that there was a melding in Alexandria especially, and in Egypt, and also in other places, but Alexandria was the center of Jewish uh, civiliz of Judaism and Hellenistic civilization. And Hellenistic civilization itself was not purely Greek, but itself was a fusion of Greek civilization and Eastern civilization, Persian, Mesopotamian, uh, and so on. Uh, so what you have is Hellenistic Judaism, as it is often referred to, um, which had an impact on all forms of later Judaism, including Rabbinic Judaism, by the way. Um, you can find elements of Hellenistic ideas um, throughout Second Temple Judaism and into Rabbinic Judaism, and sometimes in obvious and sometimes in subtle ways. Uh, it was one of the great Jewish civilizations, one second, and it, um, it was destroyed uh, in the wars with Rome and did not survive. Uh, and uh, one can speculate uh, on what would have happened if it had survived. Uh, there might not have been rabbinic Judaism at all. There might have, uh, the rise of rabbinic Judaism may have occurred, but there might have been another form of Judaism. Um, it's also likely, by the way, that um, in places like Syria, where there were extensive Jewish communities influenced by um, uh, who were part of this Hellenistic Jewish civilization, that many of them converted to Christianity um, because of the similarities between early Christianity um, and uh, the Hellenistic uh, Jewish uh, tradition. It wasn't such a big leap for them in certain ways. Uh, these are all scholarly theories which have been argued about now for over a century. Um, and Philo is in some ways, like uh, Maimonides, is the exemplar of this civilization um, at towards the last years of its existence, um, which is interesting, okay? Because by the time of Philo, it had been around for several hundred years. So what we're going to do is to begin with looking at the basic history of what happened. Um, we're going to look specifically at Egyptian and uh, most particularly at Alexandrian uh, uh, Judaism. Then we're going to look at Philo's and his family, what we know about him and his family, and his autobiographical. And then we're going to, um, starting next week, we're going to look at his political writing. Him as a defender, I, I subtitled this, philosopher, mystic, and defender of his people. We're going to start with the defender part, because that's the most historical and most autobiographical material that we have of his his political writing, which is primarily in two treatises, once one against the former Roman governor of Egypt, a man named Flaccus, um, and the second one, his report on his being part of a delegation to the emperor uh, Gaius Caligula, um, uh, where he was one of the main members of the Alexandrian Jewish delegation. Uh, so we'll start with that. In addition, we'll also look at excerpts from his work on Joseph, because his writing, his interpretation of the life of Joseph, he sees Joseph as the ideal politician. So we can learn a little bit about his political understanding from his writing on Joseph. We won't look at the whole work, we'll just look at, at bits and pieces of it. Uh, so for next time, um, this again, this is, this, is the, this is the book, quite inexpensive and complete. Uh, if you want, read the a treatise on Flaccus and the one on the legation, if you have time, um, okay? Yes, way, Cantor. Quick question. You said that Maimonides didn't know about Philo, but he knew all about 
Arista, uh, yeah, he did. So how, how, how did he... Because Philo really didn't... Um, um, uh, don't forget, um, Maimonides was reading Aristotle and the various other Greek philosophers in Arabic translations. And Philo was, as far as I know, was never translated into Arabic. Okay? And therefore preserved only in the church, in the church settings. And in fact, some of his works only survive in Armenian translations in the Armenian church. Yeah. I just wanted to mention I got this used and it's like new and it was six dollars and something. There you go, you beat up beat me. Um, <laughs> Amazon uh, Prime seventeen dollars. Okay. <laughs> but again this is this is um, an old translation um, but there's a, a good recent introduction. The more scholarly uh, translation with the original Greek is the Loeb Classical Library, 12 volumes with the Greek, if anybody wants to go a little further. Uh, I will be referring to this because this has got some good notes on some of the, specifically on some of the characters that we will um, do it. I also mentioned, for those of you who hadn't come earlier, that if you've seen the uh, series I, Claudius uh, many years ago, uh, yes. a number of the characters of uh, from I, Claudius will be showing up as, as important characters in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, the Emperor um, Gaius Caligula, the Emperor Claudius, Ti the Emperor Tiberius, various other figures who, um, King Herod Agrippa I, um, who all are in the series, um, uh, and also a couple other minor characters um, as well. Um, anybody have any questions before we go further? Yes, Sam? You said Flaccus and something else? Uh, the Legation to Gaius, it's called. Um, if, Embassy to Gaius, yeah. I mean, there are Latin names uh, for each of his works, but um, he has it. So Flaccus um, is called In Flaccum, um, and usually scholars refer to uh, Philo's works from their Latin names, um, and the embassy, on the Embassy to Gaius, which is the first part of a treatise on virtue, um, uh, meaning that there are times when we have uh, some of his works um, are we, there's quite a few. We probably have only two thirds of what he wrote. Um, there, there's likely that there were a considerable number of other books Was that he, he wrote. Read? Uh, that's a good question. We don't know. We know that the Christians read him. Well, how widely read was he during his own lifetime is quite interesting. And of course, one of the other questions is um, what he wrote, who was it directed towards? And as you will see, um, some of his works were directed at his own community. Uh, others were directed at non-Jews, primarily. And others were directed at a, an elite group of philosophically minded Jews, just as Maimonides direct, you know, um, directed the Guide for the Perplexed at the same uh, group in his own day. Yeah. Could you explain the Roman use of Greek and Latin? What do you mean? I thought they spoke Latin. No, in the East, in, in the Eastern Empire, Greek was the language, oh, so except Greek for except for the Roman administrators, um, uh, and most of the Jews in the Eastern Empire spoke Greek. Uh, the Jews of Eretz Yisrael, a considerable number of them spoke Greek, um, but those that didn't spoke Aramaic. Um, but most of the Jews who spoke Aramaic were outside the empire in the Persian Empire in Mesopotamia because. Mesopotamia was only um, part of the Roman Empire for a very short period of time under the Emperor Trajan. Um, uh, so most of the Jews um, in the Roman Empire were Greek speaking. Yeah. Was there a, a kind of Judeo Greek dialect, like the way they had in a lot of places? Interestingly enough, no. Ah. That was one of the fascinating things that the Jews of Alexandria spoke the same Greek as their neighbors, as we will get to that, because that itself is quite a fascinating issue, uh, what distinguished somebody from being Jewish, yeah. right? It's a, it, it, what did Jewish being, well, in those days, we, I'm not even only want to use the term Jewish, I want to use the word Judean, okay? How did you know when someone was a Judean or not? You will see it's not such an easy thing to, do, to define. All right, so... So the government officials spoke Latin? Probably, but they uh, most educated Romans spoke Greek as well, and and all of our documentation that we're talking about is in Greek. And um, even when we look at synagogue inscriptions um, uh, throughout that period, um, in, from the Eastern Empire and even from Israel itself, 
you do not see Latin inscriptions. You see Greek inscriptions and sometimes Hebrew and sometimes Aramaic. And who used Latin primarily? Was it well, the, the, the people in the Western Empire. Okay, in other words, uh, everybody in the western half of the Mediterranean, Latin was the primary uh, language of the empire and the government and everything else. But the eastern empire was Greek-speaking, and eventually, of course, that was reflected in the split in Christianity between the western church, where Latin is the sacred language, and the eastern church, where Greek is the sacred language, to this very day. Okay? Okay, so let's take a look, first of all, at the timeline that I've given you. Uh, well, no, you know what? Let's first. Uh, I should have. Let's look at the. Um, go to page uh, three, um, and take a look first of all. Well, can, I, I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> Try and keep the map in front of you while we go through the timeline, if possible. Okay, keep your finger on that. The first map, um, map uh, number three, the map of the uh, Hellenistic kingdoms at the time of the death of Alexander. So, um, when did uh, Jews first come back to Egypt? Um, the f earliest evidence for any Jews living in Egypt was the Jewish military colony at Elephantine, um, which is the, was the southern border of uh, Egypt. It was sort of the border between Egypt and Nubia. Um, there's an island in the middle of the um, Nile at that point that looks like an elephant from the side. And uh, there was a Jewish military colony that was founded around the year 650 BCE, meaning before the destruction of the first temple. Um, the exact date is a matter of some dispute, but nonetheless, it's very likely that it was around that time and that very likely it was founded by the Assyrians. In other words, when the Assyrians um, took over the area and conquered, they got some, uh, they took some Jews, Judea, sorry, Judeans, uh, military people, and they used them because it was not unusual for empires to use various groups of their people. Um, as militaries. It was a, it was a mercenary colony um, that lived in Elephantine for um, hundreds of years. Uh, it was Aramaic speaking um, and uh, the community eventually um, was um, died out uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, interestingly enough, they built their own temple there to God where they did sacrifices. Um, but um, Apparently, they we actually and why do we know about them? Because during excavations of Elephantine in the late 19th century, they found a ton of papyri there, uh, many of which come from the uh, Jewish community there. Um, the community, um, uh, as I said, died out, and later on, nobody knew of their existence. If you look at the timeline, you'll see that in uh, 410 BCE, the locals destroyed the temple. Uh, in Elephantine, we know because there was a letter that the people there wrote to the high priest in Jerusalem asking them directions on whether they can rebuild it or not. Um, yeah. When it's a military colony, does that mean with families? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they undoubtedly intermarried with locals, but they maintained their specific Jewish identity, although there was a certain amount of syncretism with local Egyptian religion. Um, but again, this is a group that in some ways is uh, really not a part of our story, but it's an interesting historical fact. Um, we know that when the uh, first temple was destroyed, uh, a number of Jewish, uh, probably hundreds of Jewish refugees fled Judea um, and went to Egypt, including Jeremiah. And we have text for this in the Bible, in the book of Jeremiah and in the book of 2 Kings. We don't have to look at it, but there's some, come on in guys, um, there is significant, um, uh, there's a significant part of uh, the chapter 40 to 43 of the book of Jeremiah, um, it talks about um, his experience in Egypt, and it's very likely that um, he died there, um, if you want to give these to the Ellis's. Um, um, but we don't really know anything further about that. Uh, that group. I mean, where did they? We know approximately where they lived. Um, we don't know, um, you know, what happened to them. But who knows? They could have just kept. It could have been there. In other words, there's a possibility that there was continuous Jewish existence of some sort from um, the sixth century uh, BCE. Um, you'll see that um, uh, a significant period is, of course, during the Persian period. Uh, when uh, Cyrus the Great conquered the uh, Babylonians um, and eventually Egypt. Um, we know that um, the Persians were quite good uh, to the Jews. 
the Judeans. They, caused, they allowed the Second Temple to be rebuilt. We know nothing of uh, Jews in uh, Egypt at this time from Persian sources. Um, there's actually very little about, that we know about this period at all. Um, uh, but the really important t part comes with the conquests of Alexander the Great, in, uh, starting in 334. Um, Alexander the Great, of course, is a Macedonian. He's not Greek. His father had conquered um, all of the Greek city-states, um, and Alexander then invaded the Persian Empire and conquered the Persian Empire um, in his short life. He conquers Judea, and uh, he founds... Are people finding it hot in here? Um, he founds uh, a number of cities uh, throughout his empire named after himself. Uh, there's more than one Alexandria, but the most critical one is the one he founds in Egypt, on the coast of Egypt, um, which becomes one of the most important cities, if not the most important city, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and one of the largest uh, uh, cities in the ancient world, even during the Roman Empire. Did they, um, did they all start as military posts? No, this was uh, colonies. In other words, he settled Greeks and Macedonians there. Um, what happens is that, and you can see this from the map on page um, three, is that when he dies, his kingdom is divided up by his generals. Okay? So the largest of which is the Seleucid uh, kingdom. Um, the Ptolemies, and again, these are named after his general, Seleucus and Ptolemy, um, basically controls um, all of Egypt, um, North Africa. Uh, you see Cyrene is Tunisia. Um, and um, initially, uh, the Seleucids actually controlled Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, but the very fairly soon afterwards, the Ptolemies uh, took it over very uh, quickly. Um, and then you'll see uh, there were several other, uh, you know, smaller groups um, in uh, what we call uh, Turkey and in Greece. The critic. The Maccabees. What? At the time of the Maccabees. No, this is way before the Maccabees. This is 150 years before. Took over way, way yeah, before. absolutely. Um, the to so what happens, if you'll take a look at your timeline, is that Ptolemy I um, forcibly locates many Jews to Egypt from Judea as slaves. So um, there was, first of all, forced relocation of Judeans. Um, but... Uh, Alexandria, and he settles them in various places throughout Egypt, um, but Alexandria, uh, like here, this map, which I didn't give you, uh, you'll see, um, because it also includes medieval settlements, but there are numerous um, Jewish settlements throughout Egypt during this period of time, but the largest was Alexandria, okay? And... What happens is, is that the second Ptolemy, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, these are names that, appellations they were given, um, emancipates the Jews, meaning he sets them free, um, and he settles them on various parts of land, and according to, as you will see, um, Alexandrian Jewish legend, he was the one who instigated the uh, translation of the Torah into Greek, the Septuagint which is what LXX means, because they brought 70 scholars from Judea. Uh, and we're going to look at part of that legend. Uh, so, for one reason or another, um, by the time of the second Ptolemy, uh, Jews were now um, free to uh, practice their livelihood. Um, they, um, Jews moved voluntarily, because Alexandria was becoming such a major commercial uh, center uh, and since the Jews were part of the Ptolemaic kingdom, it was the center of life, and so uh, more Judeans uh, moved there. Um, and um, uh, so very quickly, Alexandria becomes an important center of Jewish life. We have evidence that the earliest Jews who moved there were Aramaic speakers, but within a couple of generations, they became Greek-speaking. And the um, translation of the Tanakh, uh, the, for, sorry, the Torah first, uh, into Greek is an indication of that. 
that they no longer spoke Hebrew uh, or read Hebrew or Aramaic, and therefore within a couple of generations they were completely Greek-speaking. That in itself is the most significant um, element of the evolution of what we call Hellenistic Judaism. The Septuagint became the primary text for this group of in, Jews. In Egypt also? In All, anywhere where Jews spoke Greek. Okay, so the land of Israel too? Yes, everywhere. Now, um, Ptolemy the the third. now sometimes you see, by the way, there's an overlap of ruler dates. That's because they often appointed their son as co-king towards the end of their lives. This, by the way, was something that they got from the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, it, was a, it was not uncommon. Um, our earliest evidence for any synagogue anywhere comes from this time, from inscriptions from the time of Ptolemy III Eurogenites. It's because we have a synagogue inscription that you will see dedicated to him and his wife Bernice. Okay, so this is the earliest archaeological evidence for a synagogue comes from uh, Egypt. And it's plaque. Yes, the first plaque, exactly. <laughs> um, and in fact, we have about a dozen such inscriptions. So which date you you're referring to? A, a 246 to 221, um, Ptolemy III. Um, uh, the, the point is that um, we have a, a number, uh, we don't have any ruins of synagogues found in Egypt, that may be for a variety of reasons, but we have inscriptions that have been found since the 19th century in a variety of things, as well as um, cemetery, a cemetery that used to exist, doesn't exist anymore. What were these inscriptions on? Uh, they were on stone. There were stone inscriptions which suggested that, as Harvey said, they were a plaque in the wall. And dedicatory inscriptions in synagogues are as old as synagogues, as you see, mm -hmm. right? Okay, the following... What did say, like names of people? Yeah, well, usually, you know, you'll see. You'll see. Sometimes they mention uh, the officials of the synagogue. We have donors. Mm -hmm listed, I mean, a whole variety of things. A lot of these inscriptions are fragmentary. We don't have the whole thing. I'm going to show you a few of them. Um, the, the next Ptolemy apparently um, fell out with the Jews and tried to massacre them, but eventually um, reconciled to them. An important event is in the year 200 BCE when the Seleucids reconquered the land of Israel, and this was the beginning of events that led to the Maccabean Revolt, by the way. Um, and um, one of the critical moments in this uh, happened during the time of Ptolemy VI, known as Philometer, who allowed the high priest of Jerusalem, Onias IV, who had been forced out of power. And Onias was a descendant of uh, Zadok. He was a, Zedekot, a Zadokite priest. Uh, his, uh, the, the breakage of the Zedekot, uh, uh, Zadokite line, uh, which occurred, um, uh, was one of the things, by the way, which uh, caused the creation of the Qumran community. Um, uh, but Ptolemy the, the, uh, the sixth allows Onias the fourth, and Onias, by the way, is the Greek form of the word uh, Choni or Hanania in Hebrew, um, to build a temple at uh, Leonopolis, which is in the delta of, uh, of Egypt. Um, then, of course, you have the famous... Um, uh, persecutions of the Seleucid Antiochus IV, known as Epiphanes, uh, and the revolt of the, um, of the, uh, of the Hasmoneans, the Maccabees, uh, and the Maccabees uh, from 140 to 163 basically are ruling in Judea. There is a lot of contact between the Jews of Eretz Yisrael and the Jews of Egypt and North Africa, Cyrene, uh, one of the great um, if the first book of Maccabees was originally written in Hebrew um, by, as a kind of um, uh, piece of propaganda of the Hasmonean kings around the year 100 BCE, there was a second, the second book of Maccabees was written in Greek by a Jew from Cyrene, which, as I said, is, is, um, uh, is, is Tunisia. Hang on. Right here. The second book of Maccabees is actually a paraphrase of the original work, which was much longer. So here you have a Jew in Cyrene, Jason, his name was, um, in Greek, writing this, essentially a biography of Judah the Maccabee, 
um, in Greek. So it's a great piece of, uh, great again, one of the great products of this civilization, as you'll see. There were numerous works that they wrote. Um, and now, in 63 BCE, the Romans uh, take over this whole area, and Egypt becomes a very important, um, and if you want to look at the, the, the map of the Roman Empire, um, which is on page four, um, Egypt um, becomes a very important province in the Roman Empire. Uh, it, it's, you know, originally the Romans dominated the area during the last Ptolemies, but then, and the last Ptolemy, by the way, was Cleopatra, the one we know, but she was, in fact, not the first queen named Cleopatra, by the way. Many, she had many predecessors. Um, she was the last Ptolemy, uh, and when the, the, after her death um, with Mark Anthony, the Romans took direct rule over Egypt. They would no longer, be, because that was typical. You, the Roman Empire consisted of areas where there were vassal kings and other areas where there was direct Roman rule by Roman governors. So uh, why was Egypt so important? It was the breadbasket of the empire. Uh, much of the wheat that was eaten by the, by the Romans in the city of Rome came from Egypt. Uh, and in fact, um, the access to that was extremely important. So much so that the Emperor Claudius completely, the, the main port of Rome is Ostia. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Ostia. Mm -hmm. There are huge ruins of ancient Ostia that have been dug up. Um, and the harbor of Ostia was one of the most important ports of the Roman Empire because that was the port in which the uh, goods came that were then transferred either by land or by river boat uh, to Rome because that's where the Tiber exits into the Mediterranean. So uh, it was so important that the Emperor Claudius completely rebuilt the harbor to because the previous harbor was subject to a lot of, it wasn't well built, was subject to a storm, you know, when it got stormy, and uh, uh, speculators used that to jack up the price of wheat. So uh, Claudius completely rebuilt it so that it would be a lot better to allow it in. So Egypt was a strategically incredibly important to the Roman emperors, which is why they didn't want any trouble there. And of course, the main center of Egypt was Alexandria. That's it had a huge population, probably over. Uh, as much as a million people lived in Alexandria during the Roman Empire period. Um, okay, um, you'll see here, again, we'll just finish up the timeline. The, the names of the places, are they current with the, with the period? or they were given Current with the period. These are the official Roman names of the provinces, okay? Uh, Palestina uh, is really only after the Jewish revolts. In other words, uh, before that, it, in fact, what we call um, this area was subdivided into more than one area, some of which were directly ruled by Rome and others were ruled by descendants of King Herod. It was only called Palestina after the year 70. By the Romans. Roy, by the Romans. They wanted to stop calling it Judea because, the, because it was actually after the Bar Kokhba revolt, I believe. Um, they wanted to eliminate any idea of Judean nationalism. Okay, so we know that Philo was probably born around the year 20. We don't know exactly, uh, BCE. His brother, um, who became the Alabarch, and we'll discuss what that means, his brother um, Alexander uh, was probably born 10 years later. Uh, it seems that uh, Philo was the eldest of the family. Um, we know uh, another critical point in 32 CE Aulus Avilius Flaccus, again, there's that triple Roman name, was appointed as the prefect, which is the governor, of Egypt by the emperor Tiberius. Um, what happens is that um, uh, in 37, Caius Cal Caligula, who is the nephew of Tiberius, um, becomes emperor, and in the next year, there are huge riots that break out between Jews and Greeks. The population of Alexandria was divided into three groups. Native Egyptians, Greeks, meaning 
essentially Greeks and Macedonians, by the way. By the way, the Ptolemies were all Macedonians. They were not Greek. They were ethnically Macedonian. Um, and what happens is, and this is under Flaccus's governorship, um, two years later, um, there is Caius Caligula tries to place his statue in the Jerusalem temple, which causes a huge problem in Judea, but this is also when Philo heads a delegation of Jews to Alexandria uh, to the Emperor Gaius to appeal to him about restoring their rights in Alexandria because evidently the, um, what happened in the riots, uh, the impact of it was still being felt a couple of years later. Um, what happens is they don't succeed, as you will see, but a year later, Gaius Caligula is assassinated and his uncle Claudius becomes emperor. And under um, Claudius, um, things get better, a little better for them. Um, Herod Agrippa I, who is the grandson of Herod the Great, um, is actually, because he's a close friend of Claudius, he is actually given the position of direct rule in Judea. And many, uh, see, Herod, um, who I didn't put in the timeline, had ruled over all of what we call the land of Israel plus some other areas, adjacent areas, but at his death, his territories were divided up into three uh, uh, major, uh, three different sub-kingdoms to his sons. Uh, Judea then was taken over uh, for direct rule by the Romans at one point, but because of Herod Agrippa's friendship with uh, Claudius, uh, Herod Agrippa was given back Judea in direct rule, as well as some of the territories of uh, his uncle, um, and he became, therefore, the ruler of an area that was close to the size of uh, what Herod the Great, in fact, had ruled. But he only ruled for a short period of time. He died, um, and we assume Philo died around the year 50. Um, the emperor Nero, of course, um, uh, uh, becomes emperor in 54 when Claudius dies. Um, and uh, it, uh, during Nero's time, again, there is the beginning of tremendous uh, upheavals in uh, Judea and in other parts of the Eastern Empire where, uh, with the Jews. And so you begin with the, what we call the first war of the Jews against Rome in the year 66, which lasts till 74. And if you'll turn over the page, you'll see some specific dates. Um, in 66... It begins with a rioting that results uh, as a result of Roman, the Romans plundering the temple because the temple had a huge treasury from Jews all around the world and 6,000 Jews were killed in the riots. This is all according to Josephus and other sources. And also riots break out in Alexandria as well. And they are suppressed by a man named Tiberius Julius Alexander who is the nephew of Philo. At this point, he is one of the commanders of the Roman Empire, uh, of the Roman army. We'll learn more about this guy. And it's, as, again, the numbers are often probably exaggerated, but uh, according to Josephus, anyway, 50,000 Jews were killed in Alexandria and Egypt um, in the suppression of these riots. Um, in 67, what happens is Nero is still emperor, and um, Vespasian, who was one of the main generals of the Roman army, he invades the Galilee. Uh, Nero uh, dies in 68, and uh, what you have is what's called the Year of the Four Emperors, where um, Nero was the last of the Julio-Claudian clan that goes back to Julius Caesar. So there was no obvious um, successor to Nero, uh, in the, in, from the family. So what you had is a series of short-term emperors, of military commanders, and eventually Vespasian becomes emperor. Um, and he uh, gives command of the army in Judea to his son Titus. Um, and Titus is the one who completes the destruction, who completes the reconquest of Judea, uh, the conquest of Jerusalem, and the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Um, Masada holds out for another four years, um, and with the destruction of the people at Masada, the revolt officially is over. Um, however, 
that doesn't mean things calm down. And between 115 and 117, there is a second war of the Judeans against the Jews against Rome, often called the Quitos War, because the uh, general who was the main one who suppressed it was a guy named Lucius Quietus. Therefore, in uh, Jewish text, he's called Quitos. And the war are a series of revolts in Judea, Cyrene, again, that's where we have Tunisia today, Cyprus, Mesopotamia, because this is when the Romans briefly took over Mesopotamia, and in Egypt, again, centered in Alexandria, and um, Lucius Quietus uh, suppresses the revolt, acting for the emperor Trajan, uh, and in the process, the Jews of Cyprus are completely annihilated, uh, most of the Jews of Cyrene are killed, and the damage to the Jews of Alexandria is so bad, that's essentially the end of the Jewish community there of any great extent. Yes? What kind of religion is in Egypt that interacts with the Roman? Well, you have, you have native Egyptian paganism. Which still, still exists. You have uh, uh, Ma uh, Greek slash Macedonians who are doing a kind of mix between Egyptian and Greek religion. The Ptolemies sort of did that. Um, you undoubtedly had some who were still like worshiping Greek paganism and you had Jews. And also by this point, you're, I don't know when the Christian community was founded in Egypt, but it's a very old community, by the way. Which one? The Christian, the Christian community. It's, it, Egypt is one of the, uh, the, what do we now call the Copts? They're one of the oldest Christian communities in the, in the world. Um, okay, so essentially that's the end of the community and that is really it's not until a couple hundred years later that there's any kind of Jewish community back in Alexandria which eventually in the fifth century um, because of the Christians they're essentially expelled or uh, and you do not have really any kind of community there until the Islamic period but it's in this revolt of 115 to 117 that Hellenistic Judaism, the center of Hellenistic Judaism in Alexandria, ceases to exist for all intents and purposes. Yes? Is there a reason why there were no revolts under the Greeks and so many under the Romans? Well, there was. There was the Maccabean Revolt. In other words, when you look at, um, the, relatively speaking, there were few revolts. If you really think about it, there were only four. Okay, the Bar Kokhba Revolt is the final one. So in this whole long period of time, from the Alexander the Great until uh, the end of the Roman Empire, there are only four, which is over a thousand years, uh, well, no, over 600 years, you have four revolts. Those are not just the big ones. Those are the, Those are the revolts. Um, what, to some extent, the success of the Maccabean Revolt is what caused some of the Jews in the second revolt against Rome to be inspired to revolt, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> okay, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Why didn't the Jews revolt more? Why did they revolt? Uh, in other words, these are all very complicated questions, but the fact is there are only four, and three of them were disasters. Yeah. So when Islam takes over Egypt, what, what, what do they find there, like a... Like a mixture of... Yeah, kind of well, by that point, there are no pagans anymore. It's mostly a Christian... Um, uh, there are no pagans in Egypt by the time the Muslims arrive. Um, okay. it's, it's, a, it's what we call the Byzantine Empire. It's, it's Greek. It's, it's Eastern Orthodox Christianity with various uh, sects. There are some Jews there. But under the Muslims, Egypt becomes, again, a center of Jewish life. Mm -hmm. I mean, Maimonides eventually right. lives there, but that's much later. So um, 132 to 136 is the third revolt against Rome, uh, which is the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was, again, m centered in Judea and was, a, was in some ways a worse disaster than the first in terms of number of people killed. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of sources for the Bar Kokhba revolt um, like we do for the first um, revolt, which, of course, we have Josephus. Okay. But, but the taking over of Christianity has to be led by some kind of uh, emperor or something? Uh, well, it spreads, and eventually, um, uh, after Constantine, okay. um, uh, paganism is suppressed. Absolutely. Okay, so take a look now on page two. You will see a map of um, Alexandria. 
um, from early Christian times, which is not quite as old as the period we're talking about, but gives you a fair idea of what um, Alexandria looked like. Um, what's interesting is, is that the land on which Alexandria existed began to sink uh, considerably, um, which is why large parts of ancient Alexandria are in fact underwater today. They keep finding wonderful well, this is it. In the last 10 years, they've been doing incredible underwater archaeology, finding those parts of Alexandria dating back to Roman times that are now underneath the water. And there may be Jewish stuff there too, we don't know. But if you'll take a look, you'll see an area called the Jewish Quarter, which is um, sort of on the right side of the map around the middle, around the middle near the Temple of Pompeii. We know, according to um, uh, Philo, maybe we can, we can have the doors shut at this point. Uh, we know, according to Philo, that um, the um, uh, Alexandria was divided into four quarters, each named after the first four letters of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. And that the Jews occupied them in one of the quarters was they were the majority population in the area where it says the Jewish quarter. Um, they also lived in other parts of the city as well, and there were uh, Gentiles living in the Jewish uh, quarter. Um, but the fact is that they had there was one area of the city that they were primarily uh, uh, you know focused in. Um, so. Uh, as you see, there's a considerable port there. And the island of Pharos, of course, is the place where the famous lighthouse was. Pharos will become the place, supposedly, where the Septuagint was created. Um, uh, okay, any questions at this point? What do you think of the Jewish quarter? Is it's not clear on the map? Yeah, it says Jewish quarter. Oh, that way. Oh, I'm sorry. You see it? Where is it? Right here. Got it? Sorry, you know, it's the best... It didn't focus too well. Yeah, it didn't focus too well. Sometimes the photocopying doesn't come out, but it's right here. Uh, early on, yeah. way back, um, it talks about riots in Alexandria between the Jews and the Greeks. Yes. What were those... We'll get to that. Oh, Okay, it, it, that's one of those that that's one of those critical issues as to what happened, yeah. um, and why were why were they rioting? I mean, it, there's some very very particular things that were going on there, that had to do with the Jews' status. Mm -hmm. Okay, their civil status. Okay, so let's take a look now on page five, at some of the uh, earliest sources for Alexandrian Jewry, and here is the first one that I mentioned to you. Um, which is on page 5, the English translation. Um, this is the earliest synagogue inscription that we have. Um, on behalf of King Ptolemy III, Queen Bernice and his sister and wife, that was not unusual. Um, it followed the ancient Egyptian things that the Ptolemies uh, often married their sisters. All right, so that, uh, 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 that was an ancient Egyptian practice. His sister his, and wife and their children, the Judeans, dedicate the prayer house. Now, many translations will say the synagogue, but the Greek is prosuche, not synagogos. This is important. Most of the ascriptions in ancient e in the diaspora refer to prosuche, prayer houses. Uh, this is because the origin of the synagogue is actually the way we understand it is a long history of several different institutions that eventually come together. In the diaspora, before the destruction of the Second Temple, synagogues were primarily places where Jews gathered to pray. That's why they were called prosuche. In the land of Israel, in Judea, the synagogue was a civic center because the temple existed and was called Sunagogos, which in Hebrew is Beit Knesset, House of Assembly. It's the theory of many scholars that that is exactly how the synagogue in Eretz Yisrael first evolved, that it was not a place of prayer. Um, it was a place for civic affairs 
all right? Um, and in fact, had become so under the in Hellenistic times because in the earlier period, the center of civic life was the gate of the city. There were benches in the gate. The gates were rather elaborate affairs. That's where civic affairs took place. But in the Hellenistic period, following the um, the, the, st the influence of the Greek cities, that center of civic life migrated from the gate to a separate building in the town, a city hall, and that's where the synagogue probably evolved. Now, uh, there are different theories about the origins of the synagogue. I call them the early, the middle, and the late theory. The early theory is, is that a place of Jews to pray that was non-sacrificial, in fact, occurred in the latter years of the first temple. There's very little evidence of that. The middle theory is it started during the Babylonian exile in Babylon. We have some textual evidence for that in, uh, in the Bible from biblical texts we can trace to the Babylonian exile. But there's no evidence of a building. We do have evidence Jews started to pray towards Jerusalem, but we have no idea whether they were praying together in groups in a special building or not. Um, the late theory is based strictly on archaeology. And as you see, the earliest actual evidence we have is the 3rd century BCE, and then it comes from Egypt, and it comes from the Diaspora. So um, this is the first one, um, and unfortunately that's the best picture I could get. And any of you, if any of you read Greek, um, you can actually see down here where it says prosuche. Um, Here's another one. This is the second one, which is from the, um, uh, and by the way, this is not from Alexandria. This is from a settlement um, somewhere else in Egypt, a place called uh, Skidia. Um, but this is from Alexandria and dates from 37 BCE. And again, if you take a look at it, on behalf of the queen and king for the great god, that was a typical Greek term for the god of the Judeans who listens to prayer, Alphas, Alpus made the prayer room in the 15th year. Um, so Alpus apparently was the guy who built the, he was probably a community official. And so that's from 37 BCE. And I originally was only going to give you two, but then I decided to give you a third one, which is in fact earlier than that one. This is from a place called Zen Xenophirus, which is 30 miles southeast of Alexandria and dates to between 124 and 116 BCE on behalf of King Ptolemy VIII, okay, who is also called Eugenides, and Queen Cleopatra, the sister, and Queen Cleopatra, the wife, the Judeans of Xenophresis dedicated the gateway of the prayer house where Theodore and Achillion were presiding. Theodore and Achillion were the heads of the community, the Jewish heads of the community. Probably what were called the ethnarchs. Okay? So, here, by the time we have any evidence of Alexandrian Jewry or Egyptian Jewry, it's all in Greek. There's no Hebrew on these inscriptions. And we know that they had places where Jews were gathering together to pray. Okay, so we also have texts. What would they pray? We don't know. We don't know. That's a good question. We have no idea what they were saying. All the discussion on the Mishnah is... is That's so many later. hundreds of years later, we don't know. I mean, uh, there is some evidence they may have, in fact, uh, said some form of the Shema, but we really have no idea what they were saying. We, we, they probably were st uh, studying uh, the Torah, right? Because it had been translated, why else translate it into Greek? So the legend of the translation of the Torah into Greek comes from a work called the Letter of Aristeus. The Letter of Aristeus, which is not in the Bible, but was preserved by the Jews of Alexandria as an important sacred text, as a, not a sacred text, but as an important text, um, it's now part of what we call this, often called the pseudepigrapha. It's not part of the apocrypha. Um, supposedly is written in the third century BCE during the time of the, of the Ptolemy, who was supposedly the one who ordered the translation of the Septuagint and who emancipated 
uh, the Jews from slavery, namely Ptolemy II. We know, we think that in fact it was written a um, hundred years later. It's one of these things that's uh, kind of pseudepigraphal. In other words, it's all right. And it's in the form of a letter from a guy named Aristeas, who's not Jewish, by the way. Um, uh, and in it, it talks about how the Torah got translated. Um, and in the process, by the way, uh, tells us, uh, uh, has some very interesting details about Jewish religious practice at the time. Little hints here and there about what they did and so on and so forth. But here is, um, starting in uh, part nine, um, how it all got started. Would somebody like to, uh, Suzanne, would you like to begin reading, please? Demetrius of Phalerum, the president of the King's Library, <clears throat> received vast sums of money for the purpose of collecting together, as far as he possibly could, all the books in the world. What's the library talking about? The famous Library of Alexandria, mm -hmm. which when this was written existed. By means of purchase and transcription, he carried out to the best of his ability the purpose of the king. On one occasion when I was present, he was asked, how many thousand books are there in the library? And he replied, more than 200,000, O king, and I shall make endeavor in the immediate future to gather together the remainder also so that the total of 500,000 may be reached. I am told that the laws of the Jews are worth transcribing and deserve a place in your library. What is to prevent you from doing this, replied the king. Everything that is necessary has been placed at your disposal. They need to be translated, answered Demetrius, for in the country of the Jews they use a peculiar alphabet, just as the Egyptians too have a special form of letters and speak a peculiar dialect. They are supposed to use the Syriac tongue, but this is not the case. Their language is quite different. Syriac is Aramaic. And the king, when he understood all the facts of the case, ordered a letter to be written to the Jewish high priest that his purpose, which has already been described, might be accomplished. Okay, so the letter is written to the high priest in Jerusalem who at this time was under the Ptolemies, and the high priest is named Eleazar. So they, there's a whole thing about how he writes the high priest, and, um, you know, there's this, all this back and forth, um, and they're going to send a delegation of scholars from Judea, who know Hebrew and Greek, to come to Egypt to do the translation. So a little later on, uh, there's this other interesting detail, starting at the top of page 6. Thinking that the time had come to press the demand, which I had often laid before Susibius of Tarentum and Andreas, the chief of the bodyguard, for the emancipation of the Jews who had been transported from Judea by the king's father, for when, by a combination of good fortune and courage, he had brought his attack on the whole district of Coeli, Coeli Syria, and Phoenicia to a successful issue, in the process of terrorizing the country into subjection. He transported some of his foes and others he reduced to captivity. In other words, this is talking about how the first Ptolemy had conquered the territories of what was re referred to as Cola Syria, which is what we call today the land uh, which what Judea was part of. It was part of one of this a province in, um, uh, in Persian times, um, and Phoenicia. So the area today, what, everything we call Israel, uh, the territories, Lebanon, uh, you know, up into Damascus, that whole area, Ptolemy I had conquered from the Seleucids, all right? And typical, um, thereby capturing a lot of people in the process of this war. And that's how people got, that's how they got slaves, by the way. The, the primary source of slaves was war. So capturing these territories, you enslave a whole bunch of people because it's economically, you know, viable and you haul them off to wherever you want them. Go on. The number of those whom he transported from the country of the Jews to Egypt amounted to no less than 100,000. Now that's probably a slightly exaggerated figure, but there were undoubtedly lots of them. Of these, he armed 30,000 picked men and settled them in garrisons in the country district. This is not unusual. In other words, you use some of them as mercenaries to uh, become garrison uh, your outposts. And even before this time, large numbers of Jews had come into Egypt with the Persians. 
and in an earlier period, still others had been sent to Egypt to help Semeticus in his campaign against the king of the Ethiopians. This may be an allusion to Elephantine. <laughs> Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the letter of Aristeas claims there were already Jews in Egypt during the Persian times being used as mercenaries and soldiers. Okay, so this, in the process of telling this whole story, we learn about how the Jews of Egypt got there under the Ptolemies and how they became emancipated um, from being slaves so that they had an official status in Egypt, specifically in Alexandria. I mean, the estimates of the number of Jews in Egypt during the time of Philo go as high as a million Jews, the majority of whom lived in Alexandria. It, it, we just have no idea, but it is some enormous figure of the number of Jews who lived in Alexandria. It was probably, outside of Judea itself, was the largest population of Jews in the, ancient, in the Roman Empire. I'm excluding Mesopotamia, Babylon, where there were still lots of Jews from the time of the Babylonian exile, because that was in the Persian Empire. But in the Roman Empire, the largest Jewish community outside the land of Israel was in Egypt, most of whom lived in Alexandria. Okay, so now, um, it, it goes on and on and on about the translation of the work. It's, it's quite fascinating. It's written very much in a kind of style very typical of the uh, Greek works at the time. Um, and now we're going to see what happens when they finish the translation. Irma, do you want to pick it up then? Yes, yes, Sam. Ptolemy II. Ptolemy II. Ptolemy II. When the work was completed, Demetrius collected together the Jewish population in the place where the translation had been made and read it over to all in the presence of the translators, who met with a great reception also from the people because of the great benefits which they had conferred upon them. Okay, now you notice this is very similar to scenes in the Bible where every the whole community is gathered together to hear the Torah being read in the book of Ezra, uh, Ezra Nehemiah chapter 8. So this is very similar uh, and maybe a kind of literary replication of that. This is the five books of... This is, this is just the first part. Eventually, the rest of the Tanakh was translated into Greek by the Jews in Alexandria. But this is just the Torah at first. This must have gone on for weeks before that they could read the whole thing. Well, we know in, in the book of Nehemiah it took three days. So, But the point is, when they read the text in Hebrew. Go on. They bestowed warm praise upon Demetrius too and urged him to have the whole law transcribed and present a copy to their leader. See, originally it was just supposed to be for the library. Now the Jews want their own copy. Go no on. After the books had been read, the priests and the elders of the translators and the Jewish community and the leaders of the people stood up and said that since so excellent and sacred and accurate a translation had been made, it was only right that it should remain as it was and no alteration should be made in it. And when the whole company expressed their approval, they bade them pronounce a curse in accordance with their custom upon anyone who should make any alteration, either by adding anything or changing in any way, whatever, any of the words which had been written or making any omission. This was a very wise precaution to ensure that the book might be preserved for all the future time unchanged. When the matter was reported to the king, he rejoiced greatly, for he felt that the design which he had formed had been safely carried out. The whole book was read over to him, and he was greatly astonished at the spirit of the lawgiver. Who's the lawgiver? Moses. Moses. Now notice, what does the text become for the Jews of Alexandria? A sacred text. The Septuagint becomes mm -hmm. as sacred to them as the Hebrew text of the Torah is for the Jews, the, the Jews of Judea, the Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking Jews. So the Septuagint becomes a sacred text for them. Now, later on, by the way, there are other translations uh, um, of the Tanakh into Greek, um, but the, the, the Septuagint becomes the primary one and is adopted by the early church as their version of the Hebrew, of the what they call the Old Testament. That was, uh, that was their... Um, it became sacred to them. But the fact is, is that they had scrolls, because everybody had scrolls, of this, and this is what they read in their synagogues when they did Torah readings. They read 
the Septuagint, and for them, it became sacred. And notice, not making any changes, that's out of the Torah itself. If you look in the Torah itself, the Torah itself says you're not allowed to make any changes in this text. That's in the book of Deuteronomy. So they're replicating this. They're taking upon in themselves as a community that this shall now be their sacred scripture. This is a fascinating story. How about prayers in Greek? What? How about prayers in Greek? Well, that's the point. They would have been making prayers in Greek, okay? But nothing survived? I, I don't think so. Very little. Um, again, we only have, we can guess some of the things they were doing. But what was going on in the synagogues of Alexandria, or in fact, most of the synagogues at this time, we have no idea. Yes, Sam, you had a question. So, so Demetrius of Thalarum was responsible for this, basically. He's the librarian of the library of, the library of Alexandria, and he, according to this legend, mm -hmm. he's the one who initiates the project, not the Jews. Um, uh, of course, this is a legend. We don't know whether this was true or not. Um, but it's why is it so important for them to have him and the King Ptolemy involved in this? To show how legitimate they are in Egypt. And this, will, this is part of this problem that was asked about the riots. Um, the Jews constantly sought to be as legitimate in their citizenship in Egypt as the Greeks. Slat. Whenever I say Greeks, I mean Greeks and Macedonians, by the way. And this is going to become a political issue for them of highest. So this legend is a really important to them to show they were emancipated, they were given rights, um, and they have as much right to be there as anybody else. Yes, Suzanne. Isn't part of the legend that the 70, the reason it's called the 70, is that mm. supposedly they had 70 scholars yeah. independently working who translated, and the translations agreed <laughs> completely. And that was, so they knew that this was the, you know, that this was the proper sacred text. Exactly. That they see the Septuagint as divinely inspired translation. Okay. By the way, uh, many evangelicals today use only the King James translation of the Bible, and they will tell you that it is divinely inspired. Uh, what's interesting is the Septuagint itself, when you look at it and compare it to the Hebrew, and you can... You can go online and actually see an English translation of the Septuagint. So if you look at the English translation of the Septuagint, if you don't read Greek, and you look at an English translation of the Hebrew, you will notice places where the Septuagint has interpreted text, where they have there's a definite ideology behind the Septuagint, which attempts to reduce the anthropomorphisms of the Hebrew Bible um, and reflects certain philosophical trends in Egypt at the time in the Jewish community. So uh, ideas about God, the, what they choose, how they choose to translate the, the, the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav -Hey, how the, the epithets they refer to God as, um, there's definitely a certain religious ideology that's expressed in the Septuagint. The other thing you should know is that the Hebrew text that the Septuagint was translated from is not the same as the Masoretic text that we have today. Is it supposed to be older? It's different. It's a different textual tradition from Eretz Yisrael, whereas the, the Masoretic text is probably Babylonian, um, and there are distinct textual differences. And for years, scholars theorized this, because when you translate the Greek text back into Hebrew, you will see the differences. Um, but they actually found some of this non-Masoretic Hebrew of, of, at Qumran. In Qumran, they found both. The text that underlies the Masoretic text and the text that underlines the Septuagint. That's one of the fascinating things about the Septuagint. And when you look at the, some of the later books, uh, for example, the Septuagint's translation of the book of Jeremiah is 30% shorter than the Masoretic and may in fact represent the first edition of the book of Jeremiah that Jeremiah's scribe, Baruch ben Neriah, carried with them to Egypt as opposed to a second edition that was sent to Babylon. There's actual evidence in the book of Jeremiah for two editions of Jeremiah's prophecies.
one in Egypt and one in Babylon. So uh, you have to understand, it's not a translation is never just a translation. It is a very distinct evidence of particular spiritual um, and philosophical ideas that existed in Egyptian Jewry at the time. It's a very sophisticated translation. Yes, Stephen. Uh, in Alexandria, what what did it mean to be a slave and be emancipated? Well, if you were a slave, you you were you were owned by your owner. It was like. Yeah, you were you were on your property. Yeah, exactly. You were property. Um, and um, but slavery in in the Roman world was not like slavery in the American South. But uh, you could emancipate slaves, um, and slaves became thereby uh, could become, you know, full rights. They could purchase their freedom. I yes, think. they could purchase their freedom and so on. It's, it, 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 slave. I don't want really to get into, it, but slavery is a very complicated phenomenon in the, in, in 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 the ancient world. Does yeah. it mean five books? It means 70. 70. It, ref it, it refers back to the 70 scholars, that, which is why we tr we short form it as LXX, which is the Roman numerals for 70. And it's it a thing. miracle, is it not? What? The 70 rabbis agreed. Well, they weren't rabbis, <laughs> but... Uh, translators. Yeah, but again, that's a legend, right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a legend. We don't know if it actually happened, okay? What's the pseudo thing once again? Well, um... You have the, the books that are what we call canonical to the Hebrew Tanakh, right? If you look at the Protestant Bible, that's what they consider also canonical, meaning part of the Old Testament. The original Christian Old Testament included a bunch of books that still the Catholics venerate as sacred, but that Luther decided were not sacred. These books are therefore referred to as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are books that uh, don't exist in the Masoretic Bible. For one reason or another, they were not included in the Hebrew Bible. Um, most of them uh, were originally written in Hebrew. Um, the Hebrew originals were lost, and they were translated into Greek, and they were part of the Septuagint. In other words, the, the, the books of the Apocrypha were all part of the Septuagint, which means they were all considered sacred texts by Greek-speaking Jews. Some of the books were written in Greek to begin with, in Alexandria, very likely, except for 2nd Maccabees, which was written in, uh, in Tunisia, Cyrene. Um, so um, when you look at a Catholic Bible, it, uh, the Old Testament includes those books that were all in the Septuagint, but not in the Hebrew Bible. The book of Ben Sira, we know, was originally written in Hebrew because we actually have now most of uh, Ben Sira's, the original Hebrew, found in the Cairo Geniza. Um, so then there's a bunch of other books that didn't make it into the Septuagint, didn't make it into most Christian canons, but in some cases, some of them made it into the East, some of the Eastern Orthodox traditions. These are grouped in a, in a group of books called the Pseudepigrapha. Um, uh, and again, these, these classifications of Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha are really arbitrary. These are all books, when you take them all together, these are all books that were written mostly by Jews in the Second Temple period, many of them written in Greek, some of them written in Hebrew and the Hebrew originals were lost, some of them written by Christians, or some of them written by Jews and then re-edited by Christians. Uh, if you'd like, next week I can bring in, there is a complete collection of all this material in two, two fat volumes I can bring in and show it to you so you can see what I'm talking about. It's a huge variety of literature, but most of it represents the literature of Hellenistic Judaism. And it's, again, it's a whole variety of stuff. Okay, so let's go on to talk about the Jewish quarter of Alexandria. So let's, so it's very, so now we know about Jews in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in Egypt. Let's now look a little more, and here we're going to Josephus. Um, Cal, do you want to pick it up? Bottom page six, but for Alexandria. But for Alexandria, the sedition of the people of the place against the Jews was perpetual. And this from that very time when Alexander the Great, upon finding the readiness of the Jews in assisting him against the Egyptians, and as a reward for such their assistance, gave them equal privileges in this city with the Grecians themselves, which honorary reward continued among them under his successors, who also set apart for them a particular place that they might live without being polluted by the Gentiles, and were thereby not so much intermixed with foreigners as before, 
They also gave them this further privilege that they should be called Macedonians. Now, this is Josephus is writing around the year 90, okay, CE. He doesn't have this, I don't know if he knows the letter of Aristeus, so this whole idea of the Jews were slaves and then got emancipated, he's not talking about that. He's saying it was from the time of Alexander the Great, which undoubtedly Jews of Alexandria were probably claiming that when Alexander founded Alexandria, he gave the Jews, because they helped them against the Egyptians, um, equal civil rights to the Greeks slash Macedonians, which is why they should be called Macedonians. And that the conflict between Jews and Greeks was precisely over this um, uh, rights, okay? In other words, were they full citizens or not? And this was a problem uh, because if you were a citizen, you had to participate in civic rights, public civic rituals, which included public sacrifices to the patron gods of the city. The Jews were claiming a special privilege. They wanted to be equal in all aspects in citizenship, but be exempted from these public religious rights. They wanted to have it both ways. And the Greeks slash Macedonians didn't want to give them citizenship if they didn't do the other, the rest of it. So this was, this political fight was at the heart of the conflicts between Jews and Greeks in Alexandria, which occasionally broke out into open warfare. And by the way, the Jews were not helpless victims in these uh, 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 riots. They were, they were active fighters back, okay? Just that usually the authorities uh, sided with the Greeks. So, but what do we learn from this? That there was a very particular um, part of Alexandria that was the Jewish quarter to separate themselves from the Gentiles. Now, we know that very likely um, there were, we know that there were Jews in other parts of the city um, and there were probably Gentiles living in the Jewish quarter as well. It wasn't such a strict separation. Okay, let's take a look on the next page. Um, which tells us a little bit more about this. This is from the uh, Roman um, uh, geographer Strabo, but quoted by Josephus. Um, Cal, you want to read that too? It's on top page 7. Accordingly, <clears throat> the Jews have places assigned them in Egypt, wherein they inhabit, besides what is peculiarly allotted to this nation in Alexandria, which is a large part of that city. There is also an ethnarch around them, who governs the nation, and distributes justice to them, and takes care of their contracts, and of the laws to them belonging, as if he were the ruler of a free republic. In Egypt, therefore, this nation is powerful, because the Jews were originally Egyptians, and because the land wherein they inhabit, since they went thence, is near to Egypt. They also removed into Cyrene, because that this land adjoined to the government of Egypt, as well as does Judea, or rather, was formerly under the same government. So Strabo thinks the Jews were originally Egypt, Egyptians because he's referring to the Exodus, going to Judea. You know, he doesn't know Jewish history that well. But the point is, at the time of Strabo, who was written in, writing in the first century CE, um, notice what he says. He's saying there's this huge number of Jews in Alexandria and Egypt and also Cyrene, and they have a, a head. They're a self-governing community headed by a guy called the Ethnarch, which means the ruler of the ethnos. And an ethnos is an ethnic enclave. And this was very common, by the way, going back to the Persian Empire, that the Persians, um, they divided their empire, very similar to um, the uh, uh, some of the, the Roman provinces are based, go back to the time of the Persians, by the way, um, they had large provinces called satraps, and the governor of a satrap was, um, uh, uh, sorry, satrapies, and the governor was called a satrap. He was a Persian. But then the satraps were subdivided into ethnic enclaves of the various peoples who lived there. And the, those ethnic enclaves were self-governing. 
meaning the people spoke their own language, they practiced their own religion, and they ruled themselves. And the head of those ethnic enclaves was called the ethnarch. Judea, under the Romans, was, an, uh, under the Persians, was one of these ethnic enclaves ruled eventually by the high priest. What Strabo is saying is that the Jewish community in Alexandria was, in effect, an ethnos ruled by an ethnarch. Um, and, and that in itself is an interesting question. What legal, did the Jews have a legal status of being a self-governing community or not? Because this would conflict with their notion of being citizens of Alexandria. Okay, And this is an argument among scholars where we're not 100% sure this is in fact true. As you will see, the term for such a self-governing community within Greek um, uh, administration is called a polytuma. And whether the Jews of Alexandria constituted a polytuma, which was a self legally self-governing entity, is a question of debate. Okay? Now... Uh, there's a little bit of both. In other words, Strabo is one for yes, right? But now, here we're going to go, if you have your copy of, the, of the, your book, to page 729. From, uh, uh, we're going to briefly look at a section from the Flaccus, where Philo discusses um, Alexandria. So if you go to 729... Um, number 55, which is down in the bottom right corner, okay, um, 729, down in the bottom right corner, you see where it says 55? Mm -hmm. Okay, Cal, do you want to start reading that? So when the people... So when the people had received this license, what did they do? There are five districts in the city, named after the first five letters of the written alphabet. Uh, sorry, I forgot one. Okay, so there are five. Okay. <laughs> uh, these two are called the quarters of the Jews because the chief portion of the Jews lives in them. There are also a few scattered Jews, but only a very few, living in some other districts. What then did they do? They drove the Jews entirely out of four quarters and crammed them all into a very small portion of one. He's discussing the riots, okay? So I was wrong. They were in two quarters. So two out of the five quarters are primarily occupied by Jews. That's a significant, that's like, you know, that's 40% of the population. Mm -hmm. That's Brooklyn and Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, again, we learn from a Philo, who is in, uh, lives in Alexandria, something, uh, you know, fairly accurate, that a significant part of the uh, of the of the of the uh, of the city is uh, lived in by Jews. Okay, all right. So, um, according to the later rabbinic text, there is a there. We know there were many synagogues in Alexandria because they're mentioned in the accounts of the riots of synagogues being destroyed. But there is a legend of the great synagogue of Alexandria. Now, I must tell you. Philo doesn't mention it. Josephus doesn't mention it. It's in rabbinic tradition, hundreds of years later, that they mention that there is a great synagogue in Alexandria, a huge synagogue. This is not impossible, by the way. Take a look at this. This is the ruins of a giant synagogue in the Turkish city of Sardis. Sardis was one of the largest cities of the Eastern Roman Empire, and it had an enormous Jewish community. There, they found, back sometime, I forget exactly when, they found the ruins of a gigantic synagogue there, the largest synagogue ever found in the ancient world, estimated to hold between one and 3,000 people. It's the size of a football field. This, and in, in fact, was really what we would call a Jewish community center, where this end here was where the worship took place. And um, who knows what was going on here. It, there's extensive ruins. You can go there today. It's a big tourist site. Um, here's a model in the Museum of the Diaspora um, in Tel Aviv that shows it. This is the worship side going back. It's in a neighborhood. It was converted from, it went through more than one building uh, process and was converted from some other public building that the Jews bought. And along here was a street where all these stores 
existed along the wall of, of the synagogue. Um, here is what it looks like. This is looking from the worship space towards the other end. I'm going to, you know, you'll get this when I send out the, um, the recording. But if you look at online, there are tons of pictures of it. You can see online, including close-ups of incredible um, mosaics on the floor. Um, and here is um, the worship space where there were ch seat chairs in a semicircle, like in a sort of a stadium style behind, and some kind of altar here, or um, bima or something. This is probably where they read the Torah from. Uh, here's a close-up of it with these eagles and various other things. Where is this? Sardis in Turkey. Turkey. Okay. The, the, the theory is that if there was one like this in Sardis, there had to be one in Alexandria. The idea of one being in Alexandria is not impossible. That's the reason why I'm showing you uh, showing you these pictures. The, the fact that you could have a synagogue that big, um, although this is from much later, this is, this is already, you know, from several centuries after the Alexandrian, and don't forget, they're talking about a synagogue before the destruction of the temple, and synagogues before the destruction of the temple tended to be fairly small. Uh, nonetheless, it's not impossible. So let's look and see what the rabbis said. Um, Harvey, do you want to you wanna read it? Everybody got a few more minutes? Okay. What, what's the 55 stands for? Chapter? Uh, it, it's for the line, for, for the paragraph. Does that, do you have a chapter for me? Or? Uh, no, it's just a paragraph. Okay, In other words, if you, if, you look, if you look this up, you'll see it's, it's by paragraph. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Harvey. It has been taught. It has been taught, Rabbi mm -hmm. Judah stated, uh, he who has not seen the double colonnade, <coughs> of, sorry, colonnade of Alexandria in Egypt Never seen the glory of this. Notice this is a double colonnade here, a, what's called a basilica style. Right? Go on. It was said that it was like a huge basilica, one colonnade within the other. Right. In other words, two sets of 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 a columns. Go on. And it sometimes held twice the number of people that went forth from Egypt. These, this is a bit exaggerated. That would be uh, like you know more than two million people. Go on. <laughs> There were at 71 uh, cathedrals. Aha, now, well, I had to look this up. A cathedra is a chair. If you look it up, it says a bishop's chair. That's where you get the word cathedral from, the place where the bishop resides, and that's why when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, okay? But a cathedra is a Greek word for a big fancy chair. Go on. Cathedra of gold, corresponding to the 71 members of the Greek Sanhedrin. Not one of them contained less than 21 talents of gold, and a wooden platform in the middle upon which the attendant of the synagogue stood with the scarf in his hand. When the time came to answer Amen, he raised the scarf, and all the congregation grew to respond. In other words, it was <laughs> semaphore signals. Okay, say Amen, because it was so big, nobody could hear the chazan. They had no microphones. Right. They moreover did not occupy their seats. Uh, promiscuously, but goldsmiths and se uh, separately, silversmiths separately, blacksmiths separately, metalworkers separately, and weavers separately, so that when the poor man entered the place, he recognized the members of his craft, and on applying to that quarter, obtained a livelihood for himself and for the members of his family. Okay, so this is a legend. It's obviously exaggerated. We have no idea whether this building existed or how big it was, but it could have been there. It, it's not impossible. And one of the things that um, I've always wanted to know is, of course, you know, Alexandria is a modern city because, uh, you know, the Muslims built on top of the ancient ruins. I wonder if under the water or somewhere underneath anything there are the ruins of the foundations of the great synagogue. Probably not, uh, if it existed. I want to conclude today, and we'll continue next week, with uh, something really important you should know which I talked a little bit at the beginning, how would you know, if you were walking around Alexandria, how would you know the Jews from everybody else? The answer is, it was not, you probably couldn't. Uh, somebody asked about their language. They sp any indication is they did not have a dialect of Greek like later Jews in the Middle Ages did. There, in the Middle Ages, wherever Jews lived, they had a local dialect. Yiddish is, is the dialect of the Jews of Germany, right? But there was a Judeo-Arabic, there was a Judeo-Persian, there was a Judeo-Greek. There is no dialect. So there's no special accent that, that you would have noticed. 
Secondly, they didn't look any different from their neighbors. And how do we know that? Well, what I've given you here is um, from papyri of court records where uh, what are known, where in Greek you see udaioi, which is Judeans, are witnesses or parties to contract from the Ptolemaic period. If you read through these, first of all, um, you'll see most of the names are Greek, um, and look, don't look at all Jewish, but these are all Jews, and they don't look any different from the records of non-Jews, okay? In other words, they didn't look any different than their neighbors. Thirdly, they didn't dress any different than their neighbors, and we know this. Um, there's no indication that they wore tzitzit or some other kind of markings. Um, when you look at Hellenistic synagogues, and one of the famous, famous ones is the one from Jury Europas in Syria, where you have pictures of biblical characters wearing Greek and Roman dress, and they look like Greek, like the same pictures you would see. This is a very unusual, you may, we'll talk a little more about this maybe next time, but Jury Europas is an unusual uh, uh, building because the synagogue um, illustrations are quite human looking, right? And in Jury Europas, you know, you have all these biblical figures dressed in, except for some of them look like Persians. Um, this is this is the book of Esther. But they all look like anybody else. So, secondly, there is no specific Jewish physical characteristics. They don't dress any differently. There are no Jewish professions. They're doing everything. So, there's no, you know, like, niche in the economy. Um, their names are all Greek. So how would you know the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew? By what they did. And circumcision for the males, but that wasn't, it was not um, for sure because there were other peoples who practiced circumcision, but by the time of the Ptolemies it was rare uh, except for Jews to practice circumcision. But of course, that would be a rather shameful thing to do, to strip some man down to see whether or not, and you wouldn't be able to tell with the women anyway. So, the only th way that people could really distinguish between Jews and non-Jews was uh, by what they did. We, it was well known the Jews practiced the, some form of the Sabbath, and how they practiced the Sabbath, we do not know, aside from going to synagogue to read Torah and doing prayers, which we do know they did, from records like um, Philo. We know they practiced some form of kashrut. Again, what did they practice? It wasn't necessarily what later rabbinic tradition was, but we know that one of the primary things was they didn't eat pork. And they didn't sacrifice to other gods. They had no statues in their synagogues and refused to do that. By the way, it didn't mean they didn't have art. <laughs> and some of the synagogues had representational mosaics and drawings, but they didn't worship a figure. There was, you know, of anything. Um, and um, we know that they, uh, you know, um, observed holidays. And we know they went on pilgrimages to Jerusalem, as you'll see Philo himself went to Jerusalem once. So, um, that's one of the things you have to understand, that from and I'm using a loaded term here, uh, they were very well assimilated into the local culture. But they were proud of being Jews. And they themselves, first of all, they were against intermarriage. We know that. But secondly, they also referred to Jews who had dropped their Jewish identity and had stopped being uh, observant or identifying themselves as Jews as rebels to the community. And as you will see, one of the greatest rebels of the Jewish community in Alexandria was Philo's nephew, Tiberius Julius Alexander. Okay? He is the, the example of what uh, a Jew who decides to leave the community could achieve but he was considered a rebel by the community for very good reasons. Yeah. Speaking of the word apocorus, it sounds Greek. Well, it is Greek, and it means Epicurean, but that's a term the rabbis adopted. Um, so, uh, the, the, uh, so we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, there's a few more texts I want to talk about the connection.
um, the, uh, about the Hellenistic community um, and the Alexandrian community, and then we'll get on to Philo's family. Uh, if you want to read on in some of this stuff, please do. But I want to get to beginning to read Philo we, uh, next time. So if you uh, want to read, read Flaccus. That's the first one we're going to read. It's quite well written, um, and in some cases even amusing. Um, but take, um, uh, do you want me to hang on to these for you guys? Yeah. Okay. So, see you next week. Ah, yes, one particular thing. Um, what I didn't, when I booked the dates, um, let me turn this off.